Uh, my name is Jacobson Locke. I am the narrative designer and writer on Children of Morta, a hack and slash dungeon crawler with some roguelike elements kind of mixed in and with a strong emphasis on the family narrative. So let's talk about the gameplay itself. You're going through procedurally generated dungeons, getting loot and leveling up characters as well as finding out more information about this plague that's terrorizing the mountain. So I guess, yeah, let's talk about the main goal real fast. So what you're going to be doing is uh, there's this black tar, this corruption that's like seeping through the mountain, and it's essentially corrupting all the creatures, and it's turning the mountain and all its inhabitants into really hostile, uh, not, 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 not nice things to be around. Uh, so your main goal is to reach the top of the mountain and figure out what's going on. But in order to do that, you got to climb the mountain and rescuing all the lesser gods along the way. So what you're going to be doing is playing a family of heroes and you'll be going through procedurally generated dungeons uh, where you will be facing unique enemies, a unique visual theme, unique narrative events kind of taking place uh, for each theme of each chapter. And then also trying to figure out what this corruption is, where did it come from, and how do we get rid of it. So talk about what it's like writing for a game like this. It's been an interesting uh, challenge because it's a roguelike with procedurally generated dungeons, but we want, you know, we have a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. So. We've kind of divided our narrative into several threads. We have our main narrative, and then we've got our family narrative. Now, the main narrative gives you just enough information to know what's going on so you can continue to, like, you know, enjoy the game. And we really deliver that in between chapters uh, through, custom, through very standard cinematics, essentially, with narration. And that gives you enough information to know what's going on. And then there's a lot of supplementary uh, narrative behind that, like the family. Every time you return to the house after defeating a dungeon, you'll see what they're up to. They're going to have thought bubbles above their heads that are dynamically linked to all the stuff you're doing in the dungeons. Um, some of the events you find, like my favorite one right now, is you'll find a wolf cub in the caves. And if you save it, you bring it back to the house. And you then are tasked with uh, nursing it back to health. And if you do this, it becomes a permanent fixture of the house and will forever interact with all the characters in the house every time you return to it. So essentially, we want to make sure the family feels like a living and breathing entity as you progress through the game. Now, are, are there other things like that in the game where you can bring back to the house and change how the house works? There are more characters that you'll, more visitors that you'll be seeing at the house as you play throughout the game. Uh, additionally, there's some, uh, the house is also the hub where you can upgrade various um, mechanics for yourself, uh, whether it's the family or the house. And some of those mechanics will actually start to dynamically affect the world. So the idea is that whatever you do in the dungeons affects the house, whatever you do in the house affects the dungeons. So basically you could like make your sword attack more powerful or be faster, that kind of stuff? You can do, uh, we have, each character has its own unique skill tree, each member of the family, and as well as a training ground where you can upgrade the entire family's statistics at once. And we do that so that, like, you know, if you've got a level 10 character, your friend wants to jump in, their level 1 character is going to have the same stats as a level 10 character, but they're still going to start with level 1 uh, ability so they don't get overwhelmed and they still get to feel the sense of pride in progressing their character. So you guys have multiple family members. Can you talk about a little bit of brief description of what each one does and how they're differently and how they vary in, dif in, how they vary in play style? So yeah, we have six playable family members. We have the father, John, who's a sword and shield. He's a, he's a protector. That's why he's got this giant shield. So you know, he's, he's a great starter character. Then we've got the youngest daughter, Lucy, who is a fire mage. She's 11 years old. She controls fire. And uh, that's a lot of fun to write for. Uh, then we have the eldest daughter, Linda, who's an archer. So if you really enjoy staying back and like really being precise with your arrows uh, and shooting, she's a great character to play as. We have the eldest uh, son, Mark, who's a monk. He's all about hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's probably our most, di our most uh, unique character right now, where he's almost got like a mini combo system built into all his mechanics. So he's probably the most advanced character in the game to play as. Then we've got Kevin, the youngest son, who's a thief. He's going to be constantly going in and out of stealth using execution attacks. And then finally, we have Joey, who has this giant Thor-like hammer, and he's just Hulk smash guy, like just going and break everything. I love the names. They're so like American. Kevin, Joey, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of fun kind of mixing genres. We take a lot of inspiration from Studio Ghibli for like kind of the art style, as well as a lot of uh, Persian and like Middle East kind of art styles, kind of all like mashing together. And then, you know, you've got me over here in Texas. And like, so we got this like great cultural diffusion of like all these ideas coming together. So what was it like working on the F Switch platform and what did, they what did Nintendo supply in terms of tech and support to help make the game reality? That's a fantastic question. I really can't answer, like, <laughs> not necessarily, like, I'm not, not that I can't answer it. I just don't know. Just don't know. Yeah. They were helpful. They, they were great. <laughs>
Well, talk about some of the environments and biomes we can explore. You, you talked about a steampunk dungeon. Yeah, so uh, each dungeon, it's procedurally generated. They, each one has like a visual theme attached to it. So we've got a forest, a cave, and a desert. But my favorite right now is this lava. It, it started off as like a standard fire level, but quickly became essentially a steampunk city, but swap all the steam with lava. And that's control, that's what's flowing through the city. And what's great about this chapter is the theme is uh, death. Because all the citizens of this world eventually learned how they could, um, in the lava area, learned how they could use, uh, you know, augment their bodies with, you know, uh, robotic parts to basically live forever. So with the corruption coming through, it's starting to corrode all the machines. So in this chapter, you're actually helping people cope with death and helping them pass on a lot of uh, the many events you'll find there. You were a Kickstarter project as well. Talk a little about that. Yeah, so we kickstarted in early 2015, I believe February, but it's been a while. Uh, so yeah, we, we kickstarted with, I think, like three months worth of time on a prototype to kind of prove out what we wanted to do. We, and then we used that to kind of create our Kickstarter campaign. And it's been great. The Kickstarter backers are always uh, supportive. They're always curious what's going on. Whenever we release some information, they're always super helpful. We actually use them to help steer not only from their just their feedback, but when we gave them all builds, we made sure our analytics analytics were plugged in. And so we used a lot of the information from them to drive some of the uh, mechanical design choices we've made. So when does the game come out and what platforms will it be on? Cool. So we're going to be uh, we're la launching uh, later this year, summer, fall. We're still kind of like condensing when that. Gets done. Yeah, yeah, when we finish it, man, valve time. Um, so uh, platforms will be on uh, Xbox One, PC, so for Steam, and as well as PS4. And at some point, I would expect a Switch announcement in there. Maybe. Maybe. It'll be lagged behind a bit. <laughs>